Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We're just going to um, start letting some folks in. And so we'll just hang out for a few minutes until we get everybody here. So in the meantime, um, if you are familiar with Zoom, which I'm guessing you are, why don't you drop in the chat box where you're from, if you have a redistricting fact, anything like that, you know, just let's uh, get to know each other a little bit in these first few minutes. I see somebody's in sunny Colorado. Wendy, that's you. Um, I'm in sunny Minnesota. It's um, been a warm winter here so far. Lots of nice warm places. Lots of nice sunny places, I guess. All right, it looks like most of our folks have joined us. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and we'll um, we'll have a lot to learn today. So welcome to the redistricting roundup. I am really glad that you are all here with us today. And I think I can say that on behalf of NCSL and all the speakers, thank you for joining us um, on what seems to be a sunny Friday for a whole bunch of us. So thank you for coming. I think this is a really exciting time in redistricting. You know, for many months and even years, we were all sort of in the same place. You know, we had our plans, we were waiting and waiting and waiting and then waiting a whole bunch of extra months to get our census, census data in our states. And then once those numbers came out, every state sort of was off to the races and doing their own thing. So we know that some states are done with redistricting. Um, some states like where I live in Minnesota are still working their way through the process. So I think no matter where you're at, in redistricting, whether you're done, whether you're working your way through, whether you haven't even started. Um, I think the webinar today is going to be really helpful, either looking at what we're doing right now or sort of looking forward. So we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to hear first a recap of pending redistricting litigation, what's sort of going on around um, the US. Second, we're going to hear an overview about where states are at with their redistricting plans. Uh, third, and then finally, we're going to have a discussion about some changes that will help the redistricting process go a little more smoothly. And then, of course, at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So I want to take a little side note here. I think a lot of us on this call are familiar with redistricting, but I'm guessing there's also some people that are new to this concept, new to the process. So I want to give a really quick overview of what redistricting is. So all your pros that know what you're doing, know what this is all about, um, go ahead and ignore me for a minute, check your email, do something else. Um, for all of you, though, you that are new to this, let me tell you um, why redistricting is important, important and what it is. So in very, very basic terms, redistricting is the process of redrawing the congressional, legislative, and sometimes local district lines. This is done every 10 years after the decennial census. So once states have their census count, which usually occurs much earlier than it did in 2021, states redraw the lines to ensure that districts are equal in their population. And this ensures that people have equal representation throughout the state. That's the one person, one vote concept. And states vary in who is responsible for redistricting. The majority of states, either the legislature or some sort of redistricting commission is responsible for drawing those plans. If you want to know more, uh, NCSL has a ton of really great information um, to learn about all about redistricting. Okay, so I'll pull back all of you people that were ignoring me because we're going to move to the first speaker now, um, and she'll have some really useful information for all of us, no matter where we're at. So let me introduce you to Michelle Davis, who is just a wonderful person. She's brilliant, and um, she's a nationally recognized expert on redistricting, and she's a senior policy analyst for the Maryland Department of Legislative Services, um, which is the professional staff agency for the Maryland General Assembly. She has over 19 years experience as a legislative analyst and has played a key role in Maryland redistricting um, since the 2000 cycle. She's a past staff vice chair of the Redistricting and Election Standing Committee of NCSL and is a contributing author and managing editor, editor for the 2020 edition of the NCSL Red Book, which is the best resource for redistricting law in the US. 
Michelle holds a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law and an MBA from the University of Baltimore. So before I turn it over to Michelle, as some of you have seen in some of our webinars, we've been trying to get each speaker started with an icebreaker question. So today's question for you, Michelle, first is tell us what your first job was and then go ahead and take it away. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Michelle Davis. I was not ready for that icebreaker question. Uh, my first job, I believe I was 17 and I got a job at McDonald's. So uh, there you go, like a lot of kids my age. Um, and I, I don't have a lot of stories about that. Um, <laughs> so I want to start today uh, or I should say I was asked to speak on um, sort of the status of litigation, redistricting litigation, as things are ramping up. Um, and also, uh, because Ben could not be here, um, uh, we want to review sort of the status of uh, maps, map uh, the progress with uh, map enactments all over the country. So I think I'm going to start with that only because I made that the first slide. Um, so we'll do that and, and please excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna to try to share my screen. I'm not very good at this. I'm hoping I get it right the first time. Okay. All right, I hope everyone sees my PowerPoint. Just let, please yell if you don't see anything. Um, so again, uh, my name is Michelle Davis. I'm in Maryland. We are in the middle of the redistricting right now. Right now we're focusing on our congressional map. Um, and I guess I have to update my bio because um, it's not 19 years. I think it's coming up on 22 years, so time flies. But we'll get right into it. Uh, I want to show you this map. I, I made this map um, to sort of show uh, the status of redistricting maps in uh, all over the country here. So. Uh, let me, there, there is a legend on the, the lower right. I'm not sure if you can see it. I wasn't able to make it larger. So I'll just tell you what, what the legend um, is saying. Um, the, the green are, are maps that have enacted at least one map. I didn't want to get too confusing um, and make different colors for congressional and state legislative. So all of the states that are in green have enacted a, at least a map, a lot of them have enacted both. Um, the yellow, the yellow, uh, there, I think there are only two yellow states and um, I call that pending enactment. Uh, and what that means, uh, for instance, in Arkansas, um, the, the state legislative maps were uh, approved by the, the board of apportionment there, but they don't go into effect technically until the end of December. Um, and as far as I know, uh, in Georgia, uh, the governor has not signed uh, the maps yet, but uh, so it, it, that could happen at any time now. It could have happened um, earlier today and maybe I just haven't gotten the news yet. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, the, the sort of weird looking um, pink, color on the map. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not a graphic artist, so I, my, my, my colors aren't best. Uh, but the pink um, are states that have a some type of proposed map um, floating around. So it, it may not be very official, it may not have been voted on, um, but there are maps out there that, that are being considered. Maryland is one. We have um, two commissions in Maryland. One is the commission, which I work for, and the other is um, the governor's um, citizens commission. Um, and both of those bodies released uh, recommended or proposed maps. Um, and the single red uh, on this map is Wisconsin. And I, I wanted to point that out because um, that's the first veto of, of maps as far as I, as far as I know. Um, so that's why that's red. There are two states, obviously, that you can't see on this map. Uh, we just couldn't get them on there. So I wanted to just make a note uh, that Alaska um, has enacted, I'm sorry, enacted uh, its legislative maps. You can't see it on here. Um, and Hawaii, the other state that's not contiguous, um, they have proposed maps so, um, that are in circulation. So I guess they would be pink. 
Uh, before we move on to the next slide, um, I just want to make a few comments about a couple of the states. Um, Connecticut, you can see there in the green, um, they only enacted a state legislative map. Um, and Montana and Ohio enacted congressional maps and not legislative maps. Um, and in Washington, which is in the pink, and Virginia, which is also uh, pink, um, those were commission states, and those they were not able to, to get a map in or maps in by the deadline, but they did produce some proposed maps. Um, so that's why they're pink. Um, I think that's pretty much it for, for this map. If you have any questions about a particular state, I, I, I advise you to um, look at redistrictingonline.org. Um, that keeps track of, of all of the news, um, articles, video, other media, um, and the status of, of maps as this continues. So the rest of the presentation is going to be about litigation. And that's another thing that's really hard to keep track of now um, because it's something new every day. But we're going to answer these questions. How many states have active redistricting lit litigation? Um, and how many are direct map challenges? Um, how many partisan gerrymandering um, challenges are active? Voting rights claims? Um, and then this category I'm calling um, either malapportionment or anticipated failure. And so these are lawsuits that um, go to a court um, in, the, in the legal field, we call them placeholder lawsuits generally, where we're going to the court um, and we're telling the court that we think the legislature or the commission or whoever's supposed to be drawing maps, they're not going to uh, produce these maps uh, in, in the required amount of time, um, either because they have a history of not doing it or other reasons. And so the idea is to get a case open um, in a court um, to uh, allow the court to sort of take control if in fact that does happen. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then the last thing, anything new and interesting. So I'll try to answer that last. Um, and just a note, everything we're talking about now is just on the state level. Um, local, there, there is local government redistricting. It tends to happen more, more after all of the states have, have done their state uh, lines, but it could be happening now and there could be local um, cases. Um, but but we're not talking about those now, so don't don't get that confused. Um, that's that's for another day, another presentation. So the first question: How many states have active uh, redistricting lit litigation? So by my count, it's fifteen, and these are the states. And so my count means these are these are redistricting related um, cases and that are active right now. So there were some that have been closed um, since then and uh, since, since they were brought. Uh, but right now, these are sort of the, the, the active states. And you can see right now, um, you can see the list here. Um, and 15 represents um, all of the active cases minus the, um, placeholder cases, if you will. So there are a few placeholder cases. So how many are direct challenges to maps? So by my count, it's about 28. This isn't precise, um, but it's a, that's a probably a pretty close number. I think all in all, it's um, about 33, but like I said, I, I separate out the, uh, the, the sort of the placeholder cases because they're not really about maps because uh, they're they're saying that there's not going to be maps um, enacted in time. Oh, hold on one second. We just had, I wanted to just mention um, some of those, some of those cases. And I'm sorry, I have to read a little bit. I have to read my notes a little bit. Um, but of the of the active cases that are direct challenges to maps. Um, I'm just going to talk about a select few. For, for one, we have uh, four cases active in Alabama. 
um, two of them are voting rights cases and, um, and racial gerrymandering. Um, in particular, one case alleges discriminatory purpose. Um, in Idaho, Idaho um, actually is the latest um, lawsuit, which was actually, was today, today is the second, I believe uh, uh, a day ago, uh, we got the, the latest lawsuit in Idaho. It's a state constitutional um, uh, challenge um, against the map. And it's one of three, I believe. Um, so that's sort of the latest. Um, also, I wanted to, to note, uh, let's see, Michigan, um, I'm sorry, not Michigan, but Minnesota is a, a placeholder case. Um, and I'll say well, one of our colleagues, Peter Watson, is involved in, in, in this case. Um, and that, in that case, the, the court is, is um, sort of preparing to uh, perhaps draw maps if the legislature doesn't. I believe the deadline in uh, Minnesota is February, February 15th of next year. So we'll have to wait and see how, how that works. And of course, there are cases in all of these um, other states that were listed. Um, and you can actually read the court documents either on my website, redistrictingonline.org, or on uh, All About Redistricting, which is Justin Leavitt's uh, site. Um, and I believe it's because Mr. Leavitt is at the Justice Department now, I believe it's being taken over by uh, Doug Spencer. So uh, you would Google all about redistricting um, to get to that. Um, so how many partisan gerrymandering um, challenges? By my count, right now, we have about seven active uh, claims out there. And these are the states that they are in. Um, I won't go too much into that. I only have a few, not, not too much time to speak here. Uh, about four Voting Rights Act claims. Um, North Carolina and Texas are probably gonna be one of the, the most watched. Um, and I anticipate that there'll be more cases in Texas as it generally is. Um, so there's that. Um, and again, as I was speaking before, the these uh, placeholder lawsuits um, that are that are active in these states, and again, these are antis in anticipation of the state um, not being able to enact maps in the appropriate amount of time. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is well, what is new and interesting. Um, and, the, and the only thing that really pops up in my head are two things. One is a surprise that it's not interesting or that it's not happening. Uh, before we started uh, all of this and before we got our census numbers, a lot of us thought that uh, differential privacy um, was going to be a big legal issue. And indeed it was in the beginning, there were a couple of uh, lawsuits. Um, there were several states actually involved in lawsuits suing the Census Bureau, but it didn't sort of pan out um, to, to be much, at least not yet. Um, of course, that could still change, but you know, earlier last year, we were anticipating um, that, to be, that to be a big deal in the legal world. Um, so we have to wait on that. Um, and of course, the other thing is the state partisan gerrymandering um, claims. And if you're new to this, um, the big deal about partisan gerrymandering is, is that the Supreme Court recently um, sort of got out of the business of hearing uh, federal uh, partisan gerrymandering claims. So in a, in a word, you, you can't go into a federal court and, and claim that or challenge a map based on that. However, in a state court, you can, and it has happened already um, in other states. They actually where I am now, I live in Pennsylvania, and um, our congressional map was uh, overturned for partisan gerrymandering by a state court in 2018, I believe, um, and the same thing in North Carolina. Uh, so there has been some success with that. So if you are familiar with, with that um, subject um, in terms of redistricting litigation, it's really something to, to look out for. And that really will be new and interesting for the 2020 cycle. 
um, as states get into, I mean, I'm sorry, as um, litigants get into state courts and sort of test out these state constitutions. And what's so interesting is that every state constitution is different. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But the other thing I, I thought of about what was new and interesting um, this go around, at least so far, is the sort of the failure of some of, of the commissions that have been um, doing maps. Um, one, one was very unexpected, I think. The Washington Redistricting Commission was not able to agree uh, on, on maps and it went to, to their, their Supreme Court. Um, they missed the deadline by one day, which is interesting. Um, so they actually, I guess they agreed on a map, but they were a day late. So I, I think there was a, probably a lot um, leading up to that. So there was some difficulty there. Um, and then in Virginia, which I think is really, really um, the best example of sort of a commission really having a very, very difficult time. Um, and you, you, all of the the uh, meetings were recorded, and there were there were a lot of things going on with that commission, but they they failed as well. Um, and Virginia now has to the Supreme Court has to um, draw maps for Virginia. So so far, two two commissions that that have had a really rough time of it, and I'm sure there are other commissions as well, but those two were were singled out as probably the the, the most significant failures um, to date. Um, and I'm sure other others might have opinions on that later. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm not sure if I did 10 minutes or 20 minutes. I hope I didn't run over too far. I wanted to remind everyone to, to go to redistrictingonline.org. If you, if you are interested in delving a little bit deeper into what I've talked about, we do have a, a case library where you can um, actually get um, re read the actual uh, cases and some of the case materials and the, and the opinions when they when they get issued um, all all in our database. So it will be pretty easy. And again, I believe that um, this website and all about redistricting are the only two places that have a sort of a complete database of just redistricting. Uh, litigation. So that's important. And excuse me, redistricting online um, is um, sort of the, the specialty of that website is, is that there's a lot of media uh, coverage and there's a page for each state. And I want to ask everyone, I know everyone is looking from up is here from, from all over the country. Um, and if you are a staffer or you're involved in redistricting uh, in your state, please do check your state page on redistrictingonline.org. Um, I get, I get um, sort of updates from people all the time because you they know what's going on in their state. Um, and so I welcome um, anyone um, to send me updates about what's going on in their state and I can update the website uh, that way. We're hoping to make um, that state almanac um, uh, on, on the site a, a very good online sort of uh, encyclopedia, if you will, um, for the 2020 uh, cycle. So I wanna thank everyone for listening and I'm going to give it back to Lexi. Thanks, Michelle. That was really, really interesting. Uh, I'm just amazed that you have the time to track all of these things and do your work. So good work, good work on all of that. And thanks to Wendy and Jeff, who I know also help with your website. Um, it's it's fascinating and it's a great resource. So thanks to all of you for that. Um, and thanks for mentioning Minnesota. Yeah, we have sort of a unique dual process going on here. Um, so I'll turn the corner now, and our next and last speakers are Clark Benson and Kim Brace, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They'll be giving us some tips on how to make the redistricting process go a bit more smoothly. So in some states that are still working through the process, uh, these tips and tricks might be helpful right now to implement. Um, for you states that are already done, these things will be helpful to think about maybe for the 2030 cycle. And I think it's really important that we start thinking of these things now while it's still fresh in our mind. If we wait until, you know, 2029, we may have forgotten some of these things. So let's, let's think about them now. So let me introduce first Clark Benson. Um, he's a principal consultant and founder of Polydata. 
which provides assistance to both legislative bodies and commissions. Clark is an attorney by training and a data, data analyst by practice. He's a former state legislator and a National Party senior staff, but has been an independent consultant since 1989. Clark has worked on projects relating to reapportionment and redistricting and has been involved in several national legal efforts relating to census and political issues. Our other speaker is Kim Brace. He is the president of Election Data Services. He has designed databases and provided technical assistance and strategic advice on the development of redistricting commissions and state and local legislatures. His areas of expertise include demographic databases, district compactness and contiguity, racial block voting, and communities of interest. Kim has also conducted research on voting equipment, voter registration systems, and other issues in election administration. Prior to founding Election Data Services, Kim was an associate editor of Election Administration Reports, and he is a graduate from American University in Washington, DC. So back to our icebreaker questions. Could you both tell us what your first job was, and then you can hit the ground running and tell us how to smooth out the process. Well, I'll go first because Kim's going to talk about the first slide. <clears throat> so I guess it's a question of what you consider a first job, but first, <clears throat> first situation which other people paid me besides my parents was I mowed lawns during summers in the high schools and stuff. So that was, I was outside all the time and got to play tennis while I wasn't pushing the mower. Kim? Uh, well, my first job was actually, um, <clears throat> my father was manager of a television station in San Diego, California. So at the young age of 13, I got a job at my dad's TV station doing switchboard operator on the weekends. But the other thing that I had at the station was I was what's called the Kogo Roo. This is a kangaroo costume that I had to wear at, <laughs> at parades. And I was that guy inside that darn hot, sweaty costume. The love of that, of that kangaroo was that it had a long tail. And I had little kids pass coming behind me, trying to pull my tail off for multiple <laughs> years, it seemed like. So that was my first job experience. Kind of tra traumatic, I guess, on that side. So um, uh, we're going to, I'm running the slideshow that Clark and I have put together. Um, and so let me, share this PowerPoint that we have. And can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yep, all right. So let me go and uh, go into slideshow so that we get the full thing. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, we are looking at and have looked at for multiple years. Clark and I have worked together, even though we're opposite sides of the political spectrum, uh, but we are very much interested in making sure the process goes as smoothly as possible and trying to figure out how to help things along. And having done this now, both of us for uh, going into, this is our fifth decade of this craziness. You'll notice that we're both kind of gray. Uh, we're getting <laughs> older, but so this is kind of sage advice. I never thought I'd be saying that because I'm still a kid of the 60s. I, what can I tell you? So um, we've ended up looking at a lot of different things over time in what can be done and what the process could could happen. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, advance the slides. And the first thing that we have all talked about and the importance of it is really working with the Census Bureau. Right now, for all of you in the cycle, you are caught in the process of dealing with what the Census Bureau gave you. Uh, but there's a way of trying to make things a little bit better. And that is what we have seen in working the process of particularly the block boundary suggestion program. Um, and you are now experiencing within your states the circumstance of having problem 
census blocks. Well, those could be fixed. And that is what the process of BBSP is. So we would encourage all of the states to look into this. This will start again in 2025. It's a way of keeping James Whitehorn busy during the <laughs> census, uh, in between censuses. It's also the way of keeping us busy, certainly. But it is a way of trying to make sure that things look better when we start dealing with the maps that we have to deal with and producing. So census blocks and getting them correct is very important. We have made use of it in a number of states to get better information for the prisons and military bases and other kinds of special geographies that might be there. And we have made use of it here. I'm sitting in the bowels of the Rhode Island State House Legislature, and we've made use of it here in Rhode Island to make census blocks follow more neighborhoods by using back property lines, not using necessarily visible features, but showing a real neighborhood. Because now that we have aerial photographs and much better aerial photographs, you can see what you're drawing and where you're drawing. And you can see on those aerial photographs, oh, this is all woodland around this neighborhood, but the census block boundary crosses over that woodland over to that other street. And the people on that other street are not really connected with that neighborhood back there. So trying to fix that and give you the capabilities of really having better data. And for the demographers here in the state of Rhode Island, uh, this is a gold mine of information. So trying to make sure that some of that is reflected is something that you can do in looking forward to 2030 um, and fixing the problems that you're having now in 2021 and 2022. Clark? Uh, the, um, another good use of the Block Boundary Suggestion Project is in fact, it helps <clears throat> or gives you the opportunity to work on your precinct geography. Uh, there are several bugaboos that uh, we've all experienced in dealing with basically the political data, not necessarily the census data, but political data. And the number one thing that's always, that is frequently missing is precinct geography. And I don't mean that it doesn't align with the blocks, it's just that it does not exist. And so that's one thing that of course you have to do throughout the decade. And as Kim said, the, the BBSP is not gonna start for several years. So there will be like the 22, well, several election cycles, let's put it this way, I'm not sure they'll have special elections. Yeah, but the point is there'll be several cycles for which you, you have to start collecting the data now. And what that means is for every county or every town or whatever the political jurisdiction in your state is, you need to collect those maps and don't do what some states do, which is have a central repository for them. And whatever you, the county clerk, send the new map in, they very promptly and expeditiously put it on the website and there's the current map. And so at the end of the decade, you say, well, where are the other earlier maps? And they go, well, why would we keep those? So precinct geography is a critical factor for the standpoint, for the states where you can use political data. And even in states where you can't use political data, there are stakeholders who still want to assess a plan uh, after the fact and such too. So it fits in very nicely with the block boundary suggestion project. Kim? So, um... We have come up with a number of different ideas that you in your particular states could think about as you get out of this crazy process of redistricting right now. And yeah, you may not want to think about it for eight years, but it's all going to happen again in another eight years. So it's better to get prepared ahead of time and do things on an ongoing basis. So one of the things that we have seen in looking at and working in states, as Lexi has said, you know, I, I work in a whole bunch of different states, so does Clark, in trying to help them build the databases necessary for doing the redistricting. 
And part of the process and the hassle that we have and everybody has in the various states is getting election results centrally available. Now, states have done a better job. When Clark and I started in 1980 uh, and 1990, um, we had to go to every single county and dig out those election results from that filing cabinet in the county clerk's office and key punch those results and all of that fun stuff. Um, that was made easier with states somewhat collecting and centralizing those election results. Now many more states have uh, election result databases to help in that process. Um, part of the thing in terms of, of that kind of a database, have it flexible enough that you can add information to it. For anybody that's going through redistricting right now, um, you may be getting into a circumstance of looking at racial block voting and analyzing election results for how the different racial groups have voted. Well, part of the key of that is understanding who were the candidates and certainly what were the minority candidates. And if you don't have that as a collection point and a way of tallying that or adding that attribute to those election results, that becomes a real problem later on in the decade when people have a hard time remembering, well, was Joe Schmo, uh, was he Hispanic, was he African-American, whatever. It's a lot easier to collect that data during the election cycle and just doing a flag on that list so that you have that by the time at the end of the uh, decade, you're gonna make use of that information. So having those election results centrally available is critical. Um, the other thing that we have seen is um, having some sort of, in the bill that you're gonna pass now, is where can you fix technical errors in the maps? Um, as we say here, mistakes happen. Um, and how can you fix those? Um, in some states we've worked in, uh, it's not easy to fix those. It is something that is embedded within there and it's difficult or it takes another enactment of the, uh, of the state legislature and God, they don't wanna deal with redistricting again just for yeah. technical amendments. Um, so have some sort of contingency in the statute that you're writing right now to enact your plan that will help you fix those technical errors that come into play. Clark? Um, <clears throat> technical errors, it seems kind of odd when you think about technical errors too, but in fact, they happen all the time. It's just that a lot of times people just forget them, but they have real results too, which is, um, a certain state had a big kerfuffle, shall we say, after an, a legislative election where there were contests because there were recounts because recounts there were several close races in different parts of the state. And they found out that hundreds of voters had been given the wrong ballots because, in fact, the GIS aspect was, was messed up. Now, that was not technically a technical error of the redistricting plan, but it's kind of the same kind of thing, which is you've got to have a way to just fix things like that. So it, it, they don't have to reopen the whole process. And that's why the, the, the next one about researching the format that your map is gonna be memorialized in the, in the law books. It makes sense to have a generally readable description, but of course that's just not possible in most states. If you decide to put a really descriptive thing in there, it's gonna be hundreds, if not thousands of pages. It'll be like the the CR in Congress, it's just like nobody's ever going to read it. In reality, what you want is block equivalency file, which is again, for those who don't know, it's just a uh, electronic file that has only two bits of information, it has one record for every census block in the state, and it just has a block code, which is a 15 character 
set of numbers, and then it has the district assignment. That's it. Well, it's hard to put that in the, the legal description unless your uh, state legislative protocol allows for that. If they, if they can, that's fine, but that's pretty tricky to do because of course, normally speaking, a, a law is in fact the bill that is passed and signed by the governor and you know, there's some electronically available now at this point. It's hard to have a block assignment file be the, the only official aspect of the thing. So if you're gonna have to produce something that's going to be hundreds of pages long, it's useful to find that out now. I mean, at the outset of the, of the situation, because you want to make sure you have the ability to do that when the time comes, because no one is going to want to hang around and do that at the end of the end of the day. Kim? The other thing about block equivalency is, and it goes back to NCSL's help and back in 1990. Um, when uh, NCSL and Clark and I worked on that, um, uh, we were approached by the Department of Justice and we recommended to the Department of Justice that the way to help the transfer of files um, were with block equivalency files because shape files were not really that much in use at that point in time, but we know that shape files can be manipulated and can be changed if you're trying to even out a river or other kinds of things that could have a problem for anybody that lives along the river. And they're suddenly in a generalization get thrown into the other district. So shape files cannot always be the easiest thing and the best thing. Uh, as Clark said, meets and bounds are a real pain to do. Um, but certainly we've done in, in several of the states, the block equivalency file and just say in your statute that that is um, in the Secretary of State's office or it's housed in some place that is the ultimate uh, body that collects the information for the plan. Um, that makes it a little bit easier. Plus, there's, there's another advantage to block equivalency file, too, which is you do not need GIS software to use it. You can use that and run it against the census data from, say, 1980. If it's a, a plan from, you know, then and stuff without any GIS software. If you have the shape file, that's wonderful, but it has to overlay on something. And it, the point is you want it to overlay on the original uh, geography. That's not going to happen. But if you just want to do census tabulations and stuff, you don't need GIS data if a uh, system and software if you have a block assignment file because it's just a regular text file that goes in a database or an, ex or an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I guess we'll, we're on to the, the bottom one. Oh, no, we, we still have more GIS stuff too. Yeah, we've got GIS. This, this is one that is a, a bugaboo from my side. And um, as, as Lexi said, I'm involved with election administrators. Um, they can make use of and are starting to make use of GIS. And so the key is to work with them to help them out because one of the things that they have to do once we get done drawing the districts, they have to implement it. They have to assign voters to the right district and ultimately to the right precinct. More and more are seeing that GIS can help them out, but most importantly, it can find the errors that they might have. So encouraging use of GIS in your state, particularly for your local governments, um, is gonna pay off a lot as you go down the road. So we always try to encourage that. Um, we've worked with many local election administrators to try to get them up to snuff in being able to make use of it. I sat with the head of the Rhode Island election um, uh, division this morning for breakfast talking about GIS use. So it is something that is real important. And ultimately, you as legislators could conceivably provide funding for local governments to move into this direction 
because they're the ones that are going to end up deciding is Kim Brace in your district or not because of any kind of street file and issues that they've got. And getting them into the right place is so important to make sure the election's covered properly. So encouraging use of GIS. Um, in in the, this last piece was participating in the programs of the Bureau. Uh, we've talked about that. We had a new slide for that. So that's what we started with. But the other thing is there's a lot of other issues that come into play. And this next one is a bugaboo that Clark and I both have. Um, we are heavily involved with looking at election results. And election results are fine when they're down at the precinct level because you can assign those election results to the new districts that you're looking at and build the systems so that as you draw the districts, you can see the political layout of what you're drawing. The problem that we are seeing, and we certainly saw much more so in 2020 in that election, so many jurisdictions started seeing a lot more absentee ballots and provisional ballots. And those, unfortunately, in many, many jurisdictions, were all assigned to the same precinct. It was a central precinct where all the absentee votes were cast. And that makes it kind of hard when you have a 100 precincts for a county and that 101st precinct suddenly has 60% of the votes, which is what we were seeing in jurisdictions in 2020. And those 60% of the votes are not allocatable to the precincts. So if you get, you are caught right now with having votes that you don't know where they came from in this county, you've got a problem in properly allocating and properly defining your districts and knowing the political outcome in that district. So getting jurisdictions to allocate absentee and provisional ballots to the precinct and not aggregating them is critically important. Now that's gonna take money. The county election officials recognize that that means that we have to code the ballots. Many more of them are with paper ballots. They have to code the ballots so that they can be counted that way. The printers love this. It adds to the cost of <laughs> printing those ballots. But that is the only way we're going to get election results out at the precinct level so that we can use them in redistricting. And, so and it's the, been a bugaboo of Clark's and mine for a while. For sure. Because the, and, and in, uh, in the good old days, shall we say, back when we were doing the key punching and all that kind of stuff, absentee ballots, of course, was in most states was excuse only absentee. So you could basically ignore the absentees because they really were a very small proportion of the overall vote. But over the last few decades, obviously, no excuse absentee has, has come into play. And then, of course, then we have early voting as well. The biggest problem is that, especially now, more so than it was even 10 years ago, uh, there's a definite partisan break in many states as to who votes at the polls and who votes early and who votes by absentee. And so in the, in the say in the 90s, we could have allocated them, distributed the centrally counted absentees to the precincts based upon an algorithm of, you know, this precinct was 10% of the county, so we'll get 10% of the absentees and such. Well, now you can't do that because it, uh, it, it tends, especially like last in 2020, it was more so as a broad generalization that more Democrats voted absentee and Republicans voted at the polls. So you can't possibly allocate them back. If you can't allocate them back, that means if you have a state as many or several do now that have a political fact, criteria, whatever, uh, it can't uh, favor a party, can't do unduly favor a party, whatever. You can't calculate, you can't use the absentees. 
And if you can't use the absentees, then how do you really know what you're using makes sense? So that's, that's really a, the biggest problem with it. Uh, the side note on that is a lot of times absentees will be counted only for say the legislative district, but not for the governor. They, won't, they will count them differently. So a lot of times we'll have a, a, a perfect example is you have a split precinct and it has parts of two congressional districts. It will give you the vote for the congressional election for each part of that precinct, but it does not give you the presidential vote for that precinct. Well, that's a problem too, but that's, that's a minor problem compared to the absentee thing, which is if you, if you do not redirect them back to the registration precinct, then they're basically unusable for general perspectives. The, the next thing about including counts of registered voters and ballots cast by precinct, this goes back to kind of the, the first thing about having uh, the results centrally available. A lot of states do have registration, some have party registration, and some have in fact ballots cast, but they're frequently not connected to the results. And especially now when we have various means of voting, you know, as I said, you can do earlier or absentee or whatever. It's like impossible to go through, not impossible, it's very difficult, time consuming, to try and rectify the number of ballots cast, the number of votes tabulated with the registration for that precinct. Now, notwithstanding California, which has its own set of issues in that regard, it would be much better if in fact there was some easy way to do it. And some states do this very, very well. They start out with the precinct name and the registration and turnout numbers, and then they gave you the results. That usually helps considerably from the standpoint of figuring out what the, what the story is. And then it's good because you can check out errors. And that goes back to the, the next one, which is just by, if you, if you have all sorts of votes, in the good old days when you had a thousand precincts in your state and you just had everybody vote at the polls except for absentees, you had a thousand records in your database. Well, now if you have three or four or five different means of voting, because you have absentees, early voting, you have emergency ballots, you have emergency provisional ballots, you have provisional ballots, you have overseas ballots. The best thing is basically to give a record for each of those means of voting. It's a lot of data, but you're not, we're no longer printing them out. So it's not really a problem. Kim? The, the other well, reason the other to keep track of this the, the other reason to keep track of this information is that in any of the states that are going through court cases right now, you may very well have racial block voting analysis being done. And those, those people that are doing racial block voting, they need to know the number of registered voters. They need to know the number of ballots that were cast in the precinct. It's not just looking at just the election results for candidate Kim Brace or Clark Benson. It is knowing more information to help to understand the racial block voting that may be going on. So having that data can be real important on that side. Um, the final thing is, is what we have seen is as we are building databases, it is very useful to have a statewide voter file. Um, we can be using that to help disaggregating the election results. Um, for example, if you take the voter file and you geocode those voters, you'll get a lot better feel on even within the precinct where the voters are, where the election results might be better allocated uh, down at a block level than what we've done in the past of just distributing the information evenly throughout the blocks within that precinct. So, but part of that is having that voter file. And I've argued that it doesn't take a, a big problem for Secretary of State or whoever is doing that voter file manipulation and compiling is to just save a copy of it for each election and have that saved off in an archive someplace because that can be real useful as you get about doing your next round of redistricting in how to build the databases to have those voter files 
uh, for the past elections. Um, those voter files, of course, are a rotating file, um, and it's better to make just a copy of it when, when you get finished with an election. This is the people that were eligible to vote in this election. Well, and, and, the and there's a timing element to this as well, because in a sense, you really want two, ideally you'd want two sets, of, two snapshots, you want one as of election day or the day after the election day when the books are actually, whenever the books are closed. And then you just have that snapshot. Then you want to have a snapshot later on when you've added voter history, because of course those two will not match. You know, people will move the day after the election, they'll register the two weeks later and stuff. And it may take three months for some states to do the voter history. So if the only thing they save is the voter history, which would make sense to them, then we've lost track of what, what the actual snapshot on election day was. And that's to match with the votes cast, that's really the best way to do it. But that's an easy thing to do if you're doing it. Unlike precinct geography, which is in a sense the same, we want you to keep a snapshot of the precincts for the primary and for the general. But of course, that requires you to actually have them. It would be beneficial if you had GIS software. But the point is that is, as Kim says, that's, that's a dollar perspective and legislators have to really focus on this. The point is that some of these things, even though they cost money, it's like you bite the bullet the first time, you figure out how much it's really gonna take to get through the decade and you focus on it. And if you only have a few people to do it, surprisingly, throughout the decade, they can make a lot of progress. But if you have no one to do it, at the end of the day, you're gonna hire Kim or me or whoever to do all this stuff at the last minute. And then it's gonna cost you more money because it's like, oh, you've got to work full time on it. But if you have people, and you can find people in your state to do it, I'm, this is not you know, promoting us to do this thing. But the point is, it's really a, a fairly manageable project if you start it at the beginning of the decade and continue it through. And as Kim says, it has other benefits too. Yep, absolutely. So from the standpoint of NCSL, Wendy, I believe I can turn this back over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Kim and Clark and also Michelle and Lexi. This has been really great. And I've been taking curious notes and we'll write this up in some way that we'll, we'll save some of this for the future. Um, we've got resources at NCSL. If you are not getting our emails from the redistricting distribution list, please um, give your name to Christy Zamaripa. She'll pop it in the chat right now. Um, you've all got your own copy of the Redistricting Law 2020 book. If you don't, uh, there's the executive summary and uh, Christy can help you find that if you need to. We did just create a new web page, and you can think of this as a table of contents. It's not fancy, but it tells you everything that we've got on redistricting, so you can find it in one place. I hear from people, well, I think you've got it somewhere, but I can't find it. Now you can find it. And then on December 16th, we have a webinar on um, enactments in 2021 on elections administrative type topics, so you might want to join us for that. And then that, that's what I had in terms of resources. I just want the next slide has uh, everyone's contact information so that you can be back in um, touch with these amazing people who shared with us today. So that's it for me. Back to you, Lexi. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Kim and Clark. Uh, it sounds to me like some of these suggestions are sort of administrative and can be implemented by staff and others require legislative action. So I think a lot of great ideas for all of us to take away no matter what our role is in the process. Uh, and on behalf of Wendy, uh, could you, listeners out there, if you have any of your own thoughts on improving the process, please share them with Wendy or any of the other NCSL staff. Um, you have their contact info. So now, um, well, I should say we're, we're at the top of the hour a minute past, uh, but we're going to keep going and uh, answer questions. If anybody has questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. And we do have one question to start, and I'll just throw it out to the panelists. I'm not sure who wants to answer this. So the question is, could the Census Bureau's proposed 2020 post-census group quarters review make a difference to redistricting? Jump on in, whoever wants to yeah. take that one. Sounds like a Kim question to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, having, uh, I, I'm sitting right in the middle of a big activity here in Rhode Island of dealing with 
the um, prisoner population and the allocation of the prisoner population. Uh, we've, we're doing some innovative things here in Rhode Island to be able to get a better feel for prisoner information that is all part of that group quarters. So any kind of things that you can do and for all those states that are dealing with prisoner allocation, um, there's some new information. Uh, we're getting uh, a lot better data from the prisons and being able to see, see for individual prisoners. I've, I've been sworn to, to keep this information secret, but I can tally it up by uh, the, the numbers and the geographies that we have so that I can see where the prisoners can be allocated. But I can also see in Rhode Island how long they've been in prison because one of the things that has, is being explored is, well, you know, if they're only gonna be in prison for these two years between census day and when the enactment is done of the districting plan, maybe those we can reallocate because they're gonna be back in their city and their, in their homes when they end up um, voting for the first time as opposed to the lifers that are here, uh, they're gonna be sitting here all the time. And so we'll just keep them where the prison is. Those kinds of pieces of information are things that people should start thinking about and exploring what is possible with the prison institutions to see what could be done if we're gonna end up looking at the prison issue for 2030. Uh, I know some states have enacted something, but it's not going to be implemented until 2025, 20, for example, which is what Illinois has done. So having that information and being able to take a look at and look at that group quarters situation is real important. Great. Thank you, Kim. I don't see any other questions popping up um, in the Q&A. Um, and I know we're a little past one, so we'll sort of wrap it up here. I really think that this has been a great session. I know I learned a lot. Thank you to all of our speakers and to NCSL. Um, feel free to reach out to any of these folks if you have additional questions that we didn't have time to answer today. Um, and with that, I think we'll sign off and everybody enjoy your Friday. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Are we having a recap or when? Uh, yes, if you all could stay on, we'll uh, let the participants uh, um, uh, get out of the webinar and we'll stay on and, and have a quick chat. And we have an official recording is off. Is that, isn't uh, the that recording the is still signal? on at this moment. Um, uh, Shannon, I'm, we'll, 